She's muted. Yeah, she's going to give me a thumbs up. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Schmier, the president and chairman of the board of the Middle East Policy Council. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to today's program. For this, our 108th Capitol Hill Conference, we have assembled an outstanding panel of speakers to address the critical issue of the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on the Middle East. Since, since Russia's unprovoked attack on its neighbor Ukraine on February 24th, the world has watched with horror as a cross-border war has raged in Europe for the first time in more than 70 years. The impact of Russia's aggression is being felt around the world, including in many ways that fundamentally affect the peoples and countries of the Middle East. We look forward to a robust discussion of that impact with our panelists. Today's Capitol Hill Conference is our ninth to be held virtually since the start of the pandemic in the spring of 2020. This format gives us the opportunity to include panelists and audience members from throughout the US and around the world. So welcome to all of you who are joining us both near and afar. Before I turn to today's program, I would like to say a few words about the Middle East Policy Council. The council was established in 1981 for the purpose of promoting dialogue and education concerning the US and the countries of the Middle East. 2022 marks our 41st year of such contributions to the US Middle East dialogue. Our core programs are our quarterly Capitol Hill conferences, such as today's event, our quarterly journal, Middle East Policy, which can be found in more than 16,000 libraries worldwide, and our educational outreach program, Teach Mideast, which provides educational resources on the Middle East geared for secondary school students and teachers. Please visit us on the web at www.mepc.org and our Teach Mideast program at www.teachmideast.org to learn more about our organization and our activities. Concerning today's event, the conference proceedings will be posted in video and transcript form on our website, as will a recap of the program. An edited transcript will be published in the next issue of our journal, Middle East Policy. Now let me turn to today's distinguished speakers. As our first panelist, it is a special honor to have with us today, His Excellency, Minister Amin Salem, Lebanon's Minister of Economy and Trade. Minister Salem is joining us from Beirut. Our second speaker is Ms. Yasmin Zaki, a commercial advisor on the MENA, pro pro uh, MENA region at the firm Arendt Fox Schiff. Ms. Zaki joins us today from Northern Virginia. Our third speaker will be Dr. Mark Katz. Dr. Katz is a professor at the Shore School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and he is also joining us from Northern Virginia. Next, we will have Dr. Sean McFaight, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a professor at Georgetown University. Dr. McFaight is joining us today from Alabama. And our final contributor is the Honorable Jim Moran, a senior policy advisor at Nelson Mullins. Jim is a former member of Congress representing Virginia's eighth district and a member of the board of directors of the Middle East Policy Council. He joins us today from Washington, DC. The moderator of today's discussion is Ms. Basima al Hussein, the executive director of the Middle East Policy Council. Basima and I are both participating today from Washington, DC. Uh, during the program, I would ask all attendees to be sure to mute their microphones. Please submit your questions to the panelists during the program through the email address info, I-N-F-O, at mepc.org or through the Zoom chat function. With that, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to His Excellency, Minister Amin Salem, to begin the discussion, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for this introduction. Thank you for uh, putting this event together. I think it's very timely, it's very important, given 
that the entire Middle East region uh, these days is witnessing uh, unprecedented challenges, really, and changes uh, economically, politically, geopolitically, uh, you name it. I mean, the region is kind of boiling on many different fronts. Many of those countries have been going through uh, a war. Many of those countries have been going through difficult challenges, transitioning. Many of those countries are readapting their economies to get out of the fossil fuel mentality and move into diversifying their economies. Uh, unfortunately, today I am representing one of the, uh, the countries in the region, uh, meaning the Middle East region or the MENA region, that is most vulnerable to everything going on because Lebanon is such a small economy, such a small country, yet mighty in many different ways as how much it really relates and how meaningful it is to the region as a whole. However, unfortunately, Lebanon, the past uh, few years, as you all know, has been going through tremendous challenges on all fronts. Uh, Lebanon has been going uh, through an economic turmoil, particularly the past two years. Uh, poverty levels are up to uh, 70, 80 percent. Uh, GDP is at the lowest ever, and in addition to all of that, we have witnessed tremendous uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, incidents like the Beirut uh, blast uh, that really uh, uh, burnt Lebanon and tore the city of Beirut into, into pieces, adding yet another layer of challenge to the economy and to the morale in the country. Uh, in addition to our banking system being uh, paralyzed, our government has been facing a lot of challenges due to 30 years of mismanagement by previous governments. So uh, not to mention all the impacts of COVID-19 on Lebanon as well, uh, 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 that have been very, very, very uh, uh, negatively impacting every uh, bit and piece of the economy in Lebanon. Add on all of that, uh, the Ukraine-Russia crisis couldn't have came really uh, at a more uh, difficult time to add on top of all our challenges, particularly the way it's impacting Lebanon now, uh, mostly on the food security side, because as Lebanon was fighting and trying to uh, get back on its feet uh, to uh, restructure the economy and work on an IMF arrangement that we successfully concluded the first part of it uh, about two weeks ago, uh, miraculously, uh, because the international community has been very supportive of Lebanon. Uh, the, IMF, uh, uh, the IMF agreement is a vital piece for what we are trying to Lebanon to do in Lebanon. But as we are working on all those reforms and recovery activities, uh, uh, the, the crisis between Russia and Ukraine added, added yet another layer of challenge on Lebanon because we import Lebanon, unfortunately, has been following a trade model of importing everything. Lebanon imports almost everything that the local consumption in Lebanon uses. We import about 91% of our uh, uh, wheat, uh, uh, oils, and sugar, mostly from uh, Russia, Ukraine, and a few other countries in, in Europe, in addition to uh, some commodities as well from Algeria. But I can say very, very easily, 91% is from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the largest chunk, about 80% or 75%, is particularly from Ukraine. And since, uh, since this unfortunate war has started, uh, Lebanon has been directly impacted, yet we have not felt the major impact as of yet, because it's mostly related to uh, uh, commodities that we will begin feeling their pressure in three months from today. Because up till this day, we have still been receiving uh, imported orders of wheat and oil that have been stuck uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the seas uh, between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, but they have been arriving gradually to Lebanon. However, uh, the farming season in Ukraine starts today, not today, meaning uh, uh, now, 
and uh, the farmers are on the border lines fighting. So this will be a major challenge because there will be no farming season. And all what Lebanon used to import from Ukraine, now we have to look for new markets. We have to look for support from many different donor countries to Lebanon. But the biggest challenge, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to Lebanon is not just the supply. So we get from, uh, from Ukraine uh, most of our wheat, which is used in Lebanon for a very, very crucial uh, piece in the food chain today, which is bread. Uh, due to the economic challenges in Lebanon, bread became a very important element on everybody's table particularly the poor segments of the society that in many cases are only resorting to bread. There are families that I personally visited their homes that are feeding their newborn children and young children and, and, and entire family only bread uh, to a point that they uh, use very, very modest vegetables sometimes uh, to make a sandwich within, within, within bread. So many of those families don't even have access anymore or ability to buy meat or any proteins. When we talk food security, when we talk uh, uh, food components, we usually talk carbohydrates and protein. Many families in Lebanon now cannot buy anything that relates to protein intake. So in my responsibility as Minister of Economy and Trade, I have a major department within the ministry that is responsible of securing the availability and the supply chain of all types of grains to Lebanon. And on top of that list is wheat. So uh, the supply issue is a big problem because as the war keeps moving forward with no end, we know for sure that the supplies that come to Lebanon are within the same percentages, the supplies that go to Egypt, that go to Jordan, that go to Syria and many other Middle Eastern countries. I have been uh, in discussions with uh, my colleagues, other ministers from Egypt, Jordan, and many other countries around the Middle East. They have tremendous concerns as well, particularly Egypt that has a population of over 100 million. In Lebanon, we are only 5 million. And we consume uh, annually what Egypt consumes in one month. So. We are all really struggling in this together. Many of those countries are offering Lebanon a lot of help, yet the challenge remains in addition to making sure that the supplies will keep flowing is the accessibility to those supplies. Today in Lebanon, the purchasing power is very low. As I mentioned earlier, many families uh, barely have access to buy bread. The Lebanese government as of today still fully subsidizes bread at 100% rate. Uh, in order to keep uh, the societies and that particular commodity or, or, or food element available in Lebanon and uh, particularly impacting the most in need. So uh, what we are trying to do now is we are working with the international community. And uh, uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the World Bank that have jumped on board immediately and offered to work with Lebanon on a 150 million uh, emergency loan to secure the availability of, of, of wheat for another six to eight months. I just finished negotiations with them yesterday, but this remains to, be go, go, this remains to go for approval at the World Bank uh, board, and then I have to pass it through the parliament in Lebanon. But uh, this will give us just an extension of, uh, it's like a bandage. We are uh, trying now uh, to find as well other sources of uh, uh, oil. And when I talk about oil, it's particularly uh, uh, oil that we import for uh, food from uh, Ukraine, because as well, most of the Middle East countries uh, import that type of oil uh, from Ukraine, and it's now almost missing in most of those markets. I have received some data as of last week uh, that now we need to replace that type of oil with palm oil or cannoli oil 
or soy oil because within the next three months, the expectation is that Ukraine will not be able to export any more of that oil, which will as well impact uh, Ukraine in a, in a very big way. As we heard yesterday, the Ukrainian president said he would need $7 billion on a monthly basis to cover up for the economic losses that uh, occurred as of today. So uh, our program now is to work with donor countries and the international community. And the US particularly has been uh, working uh, with my ministry and with the government on looking for potential support from the US. Uh, I have personally requested uh, through the ambassador in Lebanon uh, given that we know that the U.S. is one of the largest wheat exporters in the world as well, that maybe the U.S. as well can aid, provide aid for Lebanon to create some stability, at least within the wheat issue, because uh, every other country that we resorted to has its own challenges, particularly in the Middle East. Most of the countries of, in the Middle East are facing the same issues we are facing, and what they offered to Lebanon was more on the technical assistance side because most of them have plan B programs or their economies are in way better shape than Lebanon. So uh, uh, I have uh, uh, put an official request and uh, I'm trying to see now with our friends in Washington if the US will be able to support Lebanon uh, by uh, supplying uh, Lebanon with some wheat, uh, at least for the next year until things in Lebanon, first of all, economically get better, uh, until we put an IMF agreement fully uh, executed and, and operational, uh, and until we see really how things hopefully uh, uh, develop in a positive way uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So we have a difficult year that we are really uh, trying, first of all, to fix the economy. We're trying to put some major reforms in place. And this challenge came and added up on another layer of challenge for Lebanon that hits a very, very serious uh, national security issue, which is the food security issue in Lebanon, because it impacts the health and the goodwill of every Lebanese citizen, particularly children. Uh, due to, to, the, to the unavailability of many of those commodities, we have done uh, a, a quick analysis that in the next uh, two to three months, uh, if those quantities are not available, if we don't have a flow of wheat, oil, and other major commodities in the, in the, in the food chain, uh, it will really impact particularly the youth in Lebanon and children because of the nutrition that they need. And as I mentioned, uh, the lack of accessibility of proteins. Uh, many of my uh, colleagues that are doctors that I know told me as well, on the long run, it will affect the goodwill and the health of people in general. So our challenges are many. I'm sorry, I'm overwhelming you with everything uh, uh, together. But uh, I, it was important for me to highlight the effect of the, uh, uh, the Ukraine-Russia crisis today on Lebanon, on the region, specifically that Lebanon, by every report that came out the past few weeks, has been really in the red zone as far as uh, most vulnerable countries in the Middle East affected by this war, uh, particularly because Lebanon was already in bad shape before all this hit. So uh, I look forward uh, to hear everybody's views. I'm sure uh, we will have some excellent uh, discussions now. Uh, we definitely need the help and advice of everyone that is with us today on this, on this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and we look forward to the support of the US and the international community through uh, all the goodwill ambassadors that care about Lebanon and the Middle East in general. Well, thank you, Excellency Yasmin. Uh, over to you. Sure. Uh, hi, Richard and Basima. Thank you for having me on. Um, and thank you, Your Excellency, for these illuminating insights. 
Um, to follow up on the minister's discussion, I would like to discuss in more detail the food supply issue, the food insecurity in the overall MENA region, with emphasis on Russia's invasion in the Ukraine and how it's impacted the already food insecure nations, including Lebanon, um, and putting, us at, putting them at full the risk of famine. <clears throat> so bear with me as I continue with the bad news, which the minister already highlighted. Um, I'll then turn to some specific countries in the region, conclude with some potentially good news, um, which is that there are possible solutions to the crisis. So the bad news is the world's largest exporter of wheat invaded the fifth largest exporter of wheat. This is huge, uh, as you already know. And we have also had a series of poor harvests in recent years, frantic buying during the pandemic and supply chain issues. So the price of food was already sort of skyrocketing. This invasion has led to one of the world's worst disruptions of food supply since the, world, since the First World War, and the effects are obviously being felt worldwide. Um, since the pandemic, the number of people deemed food insecure had already reached 800 million, which is enormous, um, and the highest it's been in a decade, and it's becoming much higher. So here you know, in the US, obviously we'll see food prices go up. We may pay more at the grocery store or when we go out to dinner, but the hardest hit countries will be the Middle East and North Africa for a number of reasons, which we'll get into. Um, the minister talked about crops that were already grown in Ukraine, as well as sort of future harvest. I wanna get into that and some of the reasons why we're seeing these, these food prices surge. The crops already grown in the Ukraine are not getting through, obviously because of the bombing. Uh, the, the Ukrainian ports have been bombed and ships trying to pick up grains from Russia are also being hit by stray missiles in the Black Sea. Russian crops are not subject to sanctions, but every facet of the Russian economy is radioactive. Banks are reluctant to touch anything to do with Russia. They can't, um, Russian exporters cannot receive insurance for their, for their uh, shipments. So to sum it up, Ukraine's grains are not accessible and Russian grains, but Russian exports generally are untouchable. Um, and then don't forget that other parts of the global food economy are impacted. So barley, corn, sunflower seeds, animal feed and meat, vegetable oils are all sort of part of that disrupting food chain. And then future harvests are uncertain, which as a result is causing uncertainty, which is, which is causing prices to soar. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the cost of agricultural inputs. So key ingredients used to make fertilizers come from Russia. Uh, so it's not just that the price of grains will rise, it's that the farmer's input will rise, and that's also causing food prices to go up. And the ripple effects are felt far and wide. So yes, grains in Russia and Ukraine have uh, 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 are expensive, right? But also Brazil, the largest exporter of coffee, sugar, and soybeans, um, is, is their input has, has risen because they're having their experience a lack of fertilizer and energy increases. So now we see all the staples are skyrocketing. The price of all the staples are skyrocketing. Um, also don't forget that oil is an important input for farmers. So the size of the combines that fuel that require fuel to drive this industry is another rising cost for farmers. Um, we're seeing a rise in protectionism. So Russia and Ukraine have already banned grain ex exports. Argentina, Hungary, Turkey have already announced restrictions. Uh, this causes a ripple effect. So if you see your neighbor is, is, is restricting exports, you will also do the same. And so people are, oh, countries are becoming much more protective of whatever agriculture and exports they may have freely exported in the past. A big question is how the war impact will impact the volume of output of future harvests. And I read in The Economist that a third of the harvest will be lost in the war but it's also too early to tell. That might be a very rough estimate because, you know, the real question is, will next year's harvest be planted? And we will only know that when we understand the length of the war. Um, there are dynamics that provoked a massive food crisis um, and food riots that led up to the Arab Spring. That's something else to keep in mind. We're not just talking about the price of food and nutrition. We're talking about the fact that food shortages have historically led to political, social unrest in an already unstable region. So in other words, if there's not enough food in the Middle East, volatility may be on the horizon, or I should say further volatility. Um, the longer this conflict continues, the more instability and price risk we're going to see. 
So we come to this conflict at the tail end of the harvest season and export season. We're now in the critical spring, spring planting season, which the minister alluded to when he said, today is when spring planting season is supposed to be taking place. Um, so because Russian sanctions aren't going to be lifted anytime soon, and we're seeing these disruptions sort of long scale uh, or sort of long term, we're looking at sort of a larger scale disruption long term. Um, now, as it relates to the Middle East, I'm going to get into some pretty damning statistics. Um, we are the Middle East. I say we because of uh, I, I, I'm also connected to the region, but it's uh, an especially vulnerable region, especially as it relates to the food issue, the food supply issue. So the Middle East relies directly on food export imports from Russia and Ukraine by virtue of geographical proximity and because their exports tend to be much cheaper than other sources. In 2020, one in three people did not have sufficient access to food and that number is expected to skyrocket. Um, one of the reasons that food, that food is so insecure is that the Middle East North Africa regions, their governments have severely inadequate social protection programs to protect the economic rights of the people, but also local farmers. There aren't programs to offset increasing prices. Um, obviously, many countries such as Yemen and Syria are already grappling with crisis and they're just ill-equipped to deal with this additional food insecurity issue. Um, Egypt is the world's largest wheat importer. 85% of its imports are from the Ukraine. Uh, the minister talked about Lebanon in much further detail than I could. Um, Iraq and Iran are also uh, at risk. They were anticipating a drought and they were anticipating having to double their, um, their ag imports before the invasion. Iraq usually supplies its people with imports and wheat from Turkey, but Turkey imports 90% of its wheat from the Ukraine. So we're seeing again ripple effects throughout the region. Um, I think you know it's, it's, it's a given that Syria and Yemen are already food insecure. We're already relying on Syria and um, Russia and Ukraine and are now dealing with potential for real famine. So th that was all the bad news. Um, I would like to get into potential solutions now. Um, the good news is that food production is not the biggest issue. There is enough food. The biggest issue is pricing and access. The concern is that people are getting priced out of the food market, not that there will be no food. And so that means that, you know, there are solutions. Now, so the solution of the shortage of oil was, you know, to look for other market and supplies. For grains, those solutions, the solutions are going to be more complex. Um, this is going to require strong political will and funding, which we saw from the minister in Lebanon, right? Already economies were grappling with rising inflation, and now they're going to have to recalibrate some of the funds towards income for food. Um, the question of whether the US and UK farmers can step up to fill the gap is a, it's an interesting question because the answer is, as it stands, my understanding is not today. Um, ramping up production is not as straightforward as it may be in the energy industry because first of all, increasing production actually takes a long time. And secondly, much of the farmable land in these countries, the US and UK are already locked in. Um, so there's not that much spare capacity. Crop acreage is already expected to be at a record high, and there's not that much land that we can turn over. Plus, fertilizer and energy prices, as we mentioned, has already driven prices up. So one fix is to use another crop to feed animals, for example, rice from China. Another fix would be to turn to a more plant-based diet in middle-income to high-income countries. So what does that mean? If the U.S., for example, would to turn to um, food production and consumption system becoming drastically less to feed livestock and more to feed human beings, there would actually be far more access and far more exportable foods to these countries. Um, I saw a study that said livestock takes up nearly 80% of global agriculture land for animal feed. And if EU citizens would eat 25% less meat in 2022, less soy and grains would be needed for animal feed and enough would be enough land would be available to use for farmers to produce grains for human production. So it would take a, a large shift in the dietary habits of the West, and it would probably have to come from a higher level government effort. Um, in terms of what the Middle East governments can do uh, on a local level, um, there has to be an immediate and systemic way to protect citizens' rights to adequate 
standards of living, but particularly food. So safeguards to minimize negative impacts and offsets. Um, at this point, because the situation is desperate, food subsidies are important. So many governments in the region have removed food and bread subsidies in recent years. Um, and those that still maintain them are considering reducing them significantly. I would stress that this is not the time to, uh, to reduce subsidies. Um, Rwanda, which also happens to be very food insecure and reliant on Russia and Ukraine, um, have Switch, have turned to more local farming practices. So their oil is too acidic, sorry, their soil is too acidic for wheat, but they do have um, sort of a, a local practice of growing uh, sweet potatoes and they're turning more towards that. And obviously the taste will be different and the people will have to readjust, but they're mitigating their risk of widespread famine. Um, I guess Senegal is also a good example to boost bread made of local varieties using cow pea beans, they have actually in, in implemented a system by the government to start pushing beans towards the more, uh, towards making these sort of staple products. Uh, so that's on a local uh, importing, that's sort of on a local government scale. And then on the, the larger, the larger sort of global scale, there would have to be uh, cooperation between governments, exporting governments, balancing export restrictions to protect the right to food domestically, um, but also trying to minimize the extent of possible impact on food supplies. It it, there would have to be a balance and cooperation between governments, um, as well as more funding to the IMF and the World Bank. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And I will turn it over to Professor Mark Katz. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, being a hard act to follow. That was a truly fascinating presentation and uh, hope that uh, I can uh, partly match what, what, what she has done. Um, I'm gonna to turn to a somewhat different subject. Uh, I'm someone who has been uh, studying uh, Moscow's relations with the Middle East, uh, well, since the Soviet days. Um, in fact, I think I've had over a dozen articles in Middle East policy on just this subject. And it's been a great pleasure to work with its uh, amazing editor, Ann Joyce, uh, on this. Um, just you know, during the Cold War, what we saw was the Middle East was, was bifurcated. In other words, the countries tended to be either American allies or Soviet allies and, and not have good relations with the other. There was some switching uh, of, of alliances during this period, but for the most part, uh, Middle East states belonged in one camp or the other. I can only think of two that seemed to manage the straddle and have good relations with both Kuwait and North Yemen. Uh, and of course there was one country that had bad relations with both and that was the Islamic Republic of Iran. And then of course we saw the uh, Russians retreat from the region in the uh, wake of the collapse of communism, not completely. They still kept, in fact, they actually improved their relations with both Turkey and Iran and even to some extent Israel. But when Putin came into office um, at the turn of the century, he sought to rebuild Russian influence in the Middle East, but to do so in a, in a very different way than the Soviets did. Um, that you know, whereas the United States has a set of allies and some adversaries in the Middle East, Putin set out to improve Russia's relations with all countries of the Middle East indeed all major actors, except for the jihadists. Um, and he had, and he largely succeeded. In other words, that Putin has good relations with anti-Western regimes in uh, Iran and in Syria. Uh, Putin also has good relations with each and every American ally in the region. This has really been a remarkable achievement. And I think that, you know, in terms of you know, uh, what it was like before when the Soviets were actually uh, actually encouraging the downfall of these American uh, allies um, and taking advantage you know, when they did fall, or some of them anyway, uh, that what we've seen is that, um, you know, Vladimir Putin, what he stands for is you know, in defense of the status quo in the Middle East. In other words, that what he doesn't want to see is change and that instead of the uh, like the old days, the Soviet Union was the revolutionary power and the U.S. was the status quo power, that what he's portrayed the image of Russia as, as 
the uh, premier status quo power in the Middle East, and that it's the United States with its support for color revolutions, for um, plans for for democratization in the greater Middle East, um, with its in other words, its policies of um, criticizing governments uh, on human rights issues, uh, that, um, that the US is a disruptive power and, and that Russia is not. In fact, I had a, a, a paper for the Atlantic Council some three years ago entitled, uh, When the Friend of My Friends is Not My Friend, discussing how, <laughs> how the, uh, the Middle Eastern actors that are our friends are also all friends of Russia. And I think that what we have seen is that this effort in many respects has paid off with regard to the current crisis in uh, uh, conflict over Ukraine. What we have seen is that, you know, unlike uh, most of America's Western allies, which, which have you know, joined the U.S. in terms of a sanction effort um, with regard to Russia and even uh, helped contribute arms to Ukraine. In other words, that there's been a, a fairly robust Western response. That what we have seen is that you know, in, in the Middle East that uh, America's allies have, have not been willing to go along for the most part. There's been some criticism of Russia, but, uh, but for the most part, that, that they're not interested in joining the sanctions, certainly not in sending arms to Iran. And there are several reasons uh, for this. Uh, you know, one is that there are several US allies in, in the region, uh, which are, are which see Iran as, as, a, as an immediate threat to them. Uh, and that they basically, they know that Russia has good relations with Iran, uh, and that they see their own good relations with Russia as a means of constraining Iran, at least to some extent, in other words, that, or at least making sure that Russia doesn't go along with what they see as uh, Iran's more hostile attitude toward them. And basically, they want to keep uh, Russia on side. In other words, that, that what they're fearful of is that uh, you know, the more that they join with the US in uh, punishing Russia with over Ukraine, the more that either Russia can actively do or simply the, the, the less that it can do to, to constrain Iranian behavior. And, and this doesn't just apply to uh, the Gulf Arab countries, but also to Israel. And certainly um, you know, Israeli uh, spokesmen and scholars have made the point over and over to American audiences that, well, of course, the U.S. is uh, Israel's most important ally. Americans must understand that Israel has to have good relations with Russia because of the deep affliction agreement it has with the Russians uh, over Syria, basically allowing the uh, Israelis to target uh, Iranian and Hezbollah positions in particular, and that they are very nervous that uh, Russia might cease cooperation. And certainly, you know, the uh, just before the invasion of Ukraine, and certainly since then, the Russian foreign ministry has raised, you know, this uh, talking about the Israelis doing you know, too much damage um, in Syria. Uh, and so uh, they are very frightened about this, and they 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 they're not. They're simply while well, the, their foreign ministry will make some critical statements about Russia, their prime minister has has not, and they want to protect this deep affliction agreement uh, above everything else. I think what we've also seen in terms of uh, perhaps a, a degree of U.S. surprise is that obviously they want to discourage uh, others from uh, buying Russian petroleum, uh, and that uh, to the extent that Russian petroleum is uh, off the market, uh, petroleum prices have risen. And so we would like to see you know, Saudi Arabia and the UAE increase their production. And I think the US has been very disappointed that they have not done so. On the other hand, I think from the Saudi and Emirati perspective, it was just two years ago, uh, just two years ago, March, April of 2020, when there was a price war uh, between Saudi Arabia in particular uh, and, and Russia over the issue of uh, production quotas uh, in the OPEC plus 
a framework. And you know, Vladimir Putin you know, made it clear at the beginning that he was Russia was going to produce uh, more than what had been agreed to. And the Saudis uh, punished him by ramping up their own production, driving oil prices down pretty low. And essentially, the Russians uh, had to back down on this, uh, that they had to rein in their production. And since then, uh, there has been cooperation. But I think that, you know, from the Saudi and Emirati perspective, that they, they, they don't feel that they can do you know, what the Russians had done, in other words, that, that they're, they were promoting that, you know, uh, themselves as um, you know, responsible adherents to OPEC plus quotas, and they punished Russia for doing so, so that they turn around and violate this agreement. Well, they're opening the door for Russia to do, to increase its own production when it can. Uh, and that, and that they, um, you know, that, that this is, that this is not uh, helpful for their, for their uh, own long-term oil interests. So I think that this is something, in other words, that Russia's uh, cooperation uh, with uh, Gulf oil producers, even after a period of uh, severe disagreement, has given them an incentive to continue their cooperation uh, with Russia. I think also what we have seen is that there are uh, several Middle Eastern actors uh, who have been especially unhappy with the uh, Biden administration in terms of its uh, criticism over uh, human rights issues. And I'm not saying that these criticisms are in any sense illegitimate, but what we have seen is that uh, Russia, China uh, do not criticize um, these countries over these issues. And I have the sense that, uh, you know, that uh, if, you know, from the point of view of, of several of America's Middle Eastern allies is that you know, if, if, if the US wants them to cooperate uh, with Washington over Russia, they wanna see more cooperation from the US over issues that are of concern to them. Uh, and so I think that uh, we, we have this and, and there, you know, there is a, uh, I think that you know, there's been a deterioration in relations uh, you know, even prior to this. And that, that the, the, the choices that the US would like to see its Middle Eastern actors make are, are, are ones that are, are difficult for it and they're not quite sure if these are going to be beneficial for them. I think also at, at the outset of the war that there were many in the Middle East who thought, uh, as did many in the West, including myself, that if Russia uh, uh, attacked Ukraine, that it would all be over fairly quickly. That there would, uh, you know, that there would be uh, a settlement of the conflict very much on Russian terms. That at the very minimum, Russia would take over the eastern part of the country. That it, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin himself seemed to uh, think that the Ukrainian armed forces would actually surrender, the government would fall, and that they would have someone like Lukashenko. Uh, raised into power uh, in Ukraine. This didn't happen. Uh, and uh, so I think we've all been sort of forced to, to react to this. And obviously the West has reacted one way, but as uh, both the minister and uh, Yasmina have pointed out, the longer this war goes on, the more difficult uh, situation in terms of uh, food security that the Middle East uh, faces. And I think that, you know, for there are those in the Middle East who they just want to see this war brought to an end, even if that means uh, if, uh, if Russia prevails. If it's going to prevail anyway, then uh, it would be better to have this done sooner rather than later. Uh, and so I think, in other words, just the, the interests that uh, many in the Middle East have with regard to this conflict are simply different from the interests that. Um, that that many in the West have. Uh, now, I think one one interesting exception to this uh, story of how the uh, war in Ukraine has exacerbated Russia uh, America's relations with many of its allies has been with regard to Turkey. Turkey is the one Middle Eastern country. It's of course uh, most proximate to the conflict and is most negatively impacted. The Turks have a historical reason to 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 understand that the more powerful Russia is in the Black Sea, the more that Turkey tends to suffer uh, as a result. 
And of course, we've seen uh, you know, Turkey having provided you know, drones to Ukraine, um, have uh, you know, limited uh, Russian naval access to the Black Sea uh, to a certain extent, uh, not joined in sanctions, but that, that, that um, whereas there was a tremendous degree of aggravation in uh, Turkish-Western relations previously, I think there's a, a greater appreciation both in Turkey uh, and in the US as well as NATO as a whole for the relationship. Uh, and so we've seen this, this improve, but it has, it has a, uh, it's an improvement based on a mutual perception of a clear and present danger to them both. So, um, you know, what I think that, uh, you know, what we'll see, uh, you know, going forward is that, uh, you know, Russia is going to, you know, assiduously, um, you know, court uh, governments in the Middle East. In other words, that uh, I, I was um, a, a virtual participant in one of these Valdai uh, discussion clubs that the Russians won. Not the big Valdai that Putin uh, addresses, but the little one on the Middle East that uh, the foreign ministry usually addresses. Only this year he didn't address it uh, at all. But this was, I mean, just literally days before the start of the war, and someone act, uh, it was on the Middle East. The Russian speakers only spoke about Ukraine, not the Middle East at all. And someone asked the, uh, it was the deputy Russian foreign minister about uh, the impact of, of sanctions if there was war in, uh, in Ukraine. And he was simply dismissive that you know, Russia is already under Western sanctions. Russia can trade with Asia. Russia can trade with the Middle East. Uh, and that, that in other words, there was an expect, uh, expectation that uh, you know, many countries, including those in the Middle East, simply were not going to join the West. And I think we have seen that, that, you know, uh, uh, that uh, certainly the, 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 uh, the Middle East is, is not willing to sort of get itself involved in this conflict. They would like to, um, to stay uh, out of it. So um, that's basically all I have to say for now, and I guess I will turn the, the floor over to Sean McFake. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean McFate. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I want to talk to you today about something different. I want to talk to you today about um, Russia's most infamous export these days, and that's the Wagner Group because the Wagner Group, if you're not familiar with it, may be revisiting the Middle East as they were or have already been in the Middle East, specifically in Syria for many years, um, well, for, for a few years. Um, the Wagner Group is a Russian mercenary group that serves the Kremlin and does the Kremlin's dirty work. I am one of the very few outsiders who has actually interviewed Wagner Group mercenaries. So some of you may have had your introduction to the Wagner Group with the Bucha massacre in Ukraine, um, where many you know, civilians were deliberately uh, rounded up, tortured, shot, assassinated, you know, many, some with their hands tied behind their backs, and these are not Ukrainian soldiers, these are civilians. Um, this is in part the work of the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group, um, according to German intelligence, you know, received orders from the Russian military to do these activities and to lead them and carry many of them out. We don't know how much they carried out. It, it, it could have been all of it, it could have been a minority, but this is Russian policy. And we're seeing this increasingly as Russia gets frustrated with the failures of conventional warfare, they're turning to unconventional warfare, such as flattening cities and massacring civilians as they did in Aleppo and Grozny. So this is, um, the Wagner Group has been around for, well, since around 2014. It's not Russia's only mercenary group, but it's the largest, most effective, and most infamous. In general, though, this is part of a growing international trends towards private force, towards mercenary force. So 25 years ago, this is where 
you know, most international, the few big international mercenary operations occurred in the 1990s. And most of this was by one mercenary outfit called Executive Outcomes, which is from South Africa, which is now defunct. This is today or in recent years. And the red or maroon colors, that's the Wagner Group. Russia has launched its first sort of expeditionary military operations in, you know, since the 1980s into the Middle East and Africa. And their weapon of choice is not their military, it's not SVR intelligence, it's the Wagner Group. Um, and the, the places that you see the, the mines and the oil, um, those are also secured by the Wagner Group. So why are mercenaries a growing trend? A trend that I would argue will continue to grow and, and bleed into the Middle East. We've already seen a lot of mercenary activities in the Middle East, but I think the Ukraine war is going to increase this trend in dangerous ways. So what is going on? Well, the, the actual, the core reason is this, is that when, you know, war is getting sneakier. It's getting sneakier. And the reason war is getting sneakier is because we live in an information age. And in an information age, information is more, in power, is more important than raw firepower. And this is why mercenaries are becoming a weapon of choice. Not because they're doing hacking and stuff, although the Wagner Group, we'll talk about that, has connections to that. It's because mercenaries offer maximal plausible deniability. So in an information age, if you wanna fight and win wars, it's better to have as much plausible deniability between you and the mercenary as possible. So for example, last year, you will remember, the president of Haiti was assassinated by mercenaries. We captured those mercenaries. We still don't exactly know who they worked for. They do not know who hired them through shell companies and cutout companies. And they pretty much got away with it. You know, can you, every, every time mercenaries get away with something, there are potential future clients around the world who think the light bulb goes off and says, well, I can do that too. And it's not just countries, it's also, um, you know, private industry. So for example, Carlos Goshen, who is um, the president and a CEO of Nissan, uh, was under Tokyo house arrest. And, you know, mercenaries exfiltrated him under the noses of Japanese national intelligence police um, to Beirut, which is where he lives today. Also, we've also seen the stigma against mercenaries is fading. You know, uh, nobody prosecutes mercenaries. There is a UN, inter no, there's a United Nations working group of mercenaries. It's been existing since 2005. It's pretty useless. So, you know, nobody besides the, you know, the, oh my goodness factor, the, there's no real repercussions for using them. And this is good for clients like Putin who want to fight bloodless wars, who want to hide the costs of war from their own domestic audiences, because Russians do not like seeing their soldiers coming home in body bags. We saw this during the Afghan, uh, Soviet Afghan wars. We see this now, perhaps Mark, Mark can speak to it as well. But if you, the Russians do not care about dead mercenaries. So it's a way to, for Putin to hide the true costs of war. All this together means that people who hire mercenaries can engage in more risk-taking. This lowers the entry of, and barriers uh, to, arm, to, enter, to going into armed conflict. It lowers the barriers to entering warfare. And this creates moral hazard in public policy making. You know, this is a new tool that the super rich and states uh, both arm, you know, there could be, you know, uh, you know, very, you know, who knows? I mean, I hate to say this, but like, you know, if Elon Musk wants to have a private army, he could do so these days. Uh, same with oligarchs, same with states. Russia is not the first. Nigeria, a lot of other states, you have used mercenaries. Um, but Russia is the biggest right now. 
So here's how it works in Russia. Now, these mercenaries, contrary to some Russia analysts, these are not GRU militia. The GRU is the Russian military intelligence agency. agency. They do not, these are non-statutory forces. They are owned by this oligarch called Prigozhin, sometimes called Putin's chef. And he's in tight ties with Putin's inner circle. Now, just so you know, he's been sanctioned by the US, the UK, and the EU for several years now. It has not had any negative impact on his negative activity around the world. Now, he owns this, this umbrella corp corporation called Concord Group. And under Concord Group is, you know, this guy, Dmitry Ukin, who's a retired Russian Colonel Spetsnaz or Special Forces officer who created the Wagner Group and still leads it on the ground today. Now, Prigozhin also owns the troll factory in St. Petersburg called the Internet Research Agency. And Wagner and the troll factory work hand in hand. They're two separate organizations. And Wagner, by the way, is not a legal entity. It's a nickname. If, when you're getting paid by Wagner, it usually comes through some other sort of shell company. But the, basically, the research agency, the, the troll factory creates, you know, in addition to trying to hack people's elections, it creates the fog of war through disinformation. And Wagner Group mercenaries slither through it using plausible deniability to attain Putin's strategic objectives. And also the way they get paid is they work out, uh, Evra Polis is an extractive industry company. It does mining, oil, gas. Um, and so what they try to do is they did in Syria, for example, is they agreed with Putin's sanctioning a government deal with Syria that they would clear out um, stronghold held by ISIS in exchange for sharing, you know, profit sharing from mines and, and oil and gas there. So extractive industry is how Concord pays its mercenaries and probably it's, you know, this, the troll factory. This is what they can do. They can do combat direct action, which we're seeing in Ukraine. They can do training and equipping, as we've seen in Mali and Central African Republic and in Syria. Um, they could do close protection and regime security. So like in Mali, Mali has just had, you know, has had two coup d'etats in the last year or so. And they have a military junta who's in charge. And they hired Wagner Group to strengthen ties with Russia. And also Wagner does regime security. So Wagner will figure out who's trying to assassinate the junta and they'll take them out or threaten to take them out. They do strategic reconnaissance. What this means is they go to non-permissive places, like you know, a country, and they do think they they do object uh, they do reconnaissance there. They they are hired to do human rights violations. This is one of their chief selling points. And right now it befuddles international law and the International Criminal Court because who are these people? I mean, international law does, is very ambiguous about mercenaries. They do fifth column activities, which is we started to see them leave from Africa uh, around early February to go to Ukraine to act as a fifth column in plain clothes. And they, in, in Ukraine, we believe they have a kill or capture list of political leadership, of political leadership. The problem with this is that they are part of a growing market. And when I talk to members of the Wagner group, they, you know, they are not happy. They are not all Russians. They are from Russia and some of the Russian border countries, like from like the former Soviet republics, not in Europe and other places. Um, they would like to get out of Russia. They many have told me that they would like to actually work for a Gulf state, make a lot more money, don't have to worry about you know being killed as much. And but the the problem right now is is that Russia in a very Russian way. Russia has very strict anti-mercenary laws on their books, yet Russian government hires these mercenaries to do stuff in Ukraine and the Middle East and Africa. So if a, if a Wagner group start, guy starts to look around for other contracts or talks to a foreigner, 
the Russian police may roll them up and arrest them as mercenaries. It's, it's how the Russians maintain discipline in their mercenary ranks. It's a very Kafka-esque solution. But the thing is, is that more, the more the mercenaries you know, exist and proliferate, the more other clients will start to look at them as I can use them. And the more that everything, you know, you can get away with using mercenaries, it just puts, you know, fuel on the fire of this illicit marketplace. And the consequences, the concerns, I mean, we know that international relations, well, sorry, you know, we, we've seen this industry grow exponentially in the last 30 years, but always in the shadows. And that international law is futile to, to address this problem. And even if we had good international laws on the books, which we do not, who's going to go into Ukraine or Yemen or Libya and arrest all those mercenaries? The United Nations isn't. And your mercenaries can shoot your law enforcement dead, making it very difficult to regulate. Also, sanctions have had a, almost zero impact on the Wagner Group's activities, on Prigozhin's activities, on the Troll Factory's activities. So this matters because I think this is a growing pattern in international relations. Mercenaries are attracted to conflict markets where there is you know, natural resources to be had, uh, you know, either weak rule of law or, or, or armed politics going on in that region. And that of course means the Middle East, Africa, and other places. And this is part of a growing trend that historically we know that mercenaries start and elongate wars for profit. And it allows also the super rich and foreign powers to muck around in other countries. And so this is something that a lot of say four-star generals around the world just do not think about. They think of mercenaries as cheap Hollywood victim of villains but in fact, they're, they're, it's a serious and growing trend. And I think that the war in Ukraine is going to propel this trade and, and not um, sort of reduce it. So um, with that, we can talk about solutions in Q&A, but I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Moran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. And I want to thank all of the panelists. I appreciate uh, the insight into uh, what the Wagner Group is up to, i.e. Uh, 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 Putin, uh, really, there's no question, but it's an essential element of, of strategic plans. And, and of course, uh, the, uh, the issue in terms of uh, hunger in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, it, few people are aware that nearly all of them, about 90% of the wheat that feeds Lebanon uh, it, it comes from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, about 86% uh, uh, is the case in Egypt. Um, and so uh, there's enormous implications uh, for this conflict in Ukraine. But perhaps the best way to address it on kind of a global scale is to talk about winners and losers. Uh, I do think the United States could be a, considered a winner. Uh, because the U.S. has regained credibility that was lost over uh, the years between 2017 and, and, uh, and 2021, uh, particularly with uh, uh, international agencies, many of which the United States uh, uh, was instrumental in forming in the first place. Uh, the, the U.S. is once again the principal leader and supplier of NATO uh, the U.S. is the country that other countries uh, uh, that are vulnerable to, uh, uh, to invasion uh, are going to turn to. I think we've been at least as responsive, if not more so. Uh, and, and I think the U.S. gets more credit because we're not immediately endangered. We've got uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans protecting us. So we're doing it because it's the right thing to do in terms of substantial uh, help to Ukraine. Of course, no American lives have been lost. And uh, what we're providing is a fraction of our three quarters of a trillion dollar military budget. So the US is a, a winner. Uh, Putin is a loser. And thus Russia is a loser because right now, Russia is Putin, unfortunately, uh, for the Russian people. Uh, everything that Putin would have wanted to have accomplished uh, is, has failed. Uh, I think he wanted to do what he did in Georgia, 
uh, which was to invade, kill a lot of people, intimidate the rest, and then steal um, uh, areas of land that were uh, contiguous to Russia. Uh, he thought he'd do that, uh, and ultimately um, uh, the Donbass region, uh, uh, the basically eastern Ukraine, which is kind of a, the breadbasket in Ukraine, would be part of Russia. Uh, and, he'd, and he would link up Odessa, Mariupol. Uh, he would basically landlock uh, Ukraine and then leave them to their own devices. Uh, hopefully that will not happen. Uh, but in the process of doing that, uh, a, uh, uh, an organization that uh, was seen as uh, weak and getting weaker has now been strengthened and more united. NATO is again a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it represents the West and, and Western values and is probably going to increase in scope. Uh, Sweden, Finland, the, the Baltic nations, you name it, uh, they wanna be part of NATO because they see what happens if they are not. Um, uh, they, and uh, and I, I think that uh, Putin's plans, uh, particularly on the uh, African continent and, and in the Middle East, are uh, compromised now. They've been competing with China, sometimes uh, as allies, but mostly uh, 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 as uh, sort of benign competitors uh, for natural resources, uh, for strategic locations of ports, et cetera. Uh, and of course, for playing an essential element in the uh, military security of various nations. I don't see how Russia has the resources to do that uh, anymore. So Russia's a loser uh, in this. Uh, there are very few winners. Uh, so I, I'll mention them first. Uh, China is uh, probably a little bit of a winner because uh, uh, rather than it initiated initiating uh, uh, conflict uh, and carrying out its objectives, uh, which in this case would have been uh, Taiwan, uh, they can sit back and watch what happens uh, and realize that the West is not as weak as had uh, been and had been characterized as and, and that uh, there would be a reaction if they invaded Taiwan. So I, I think they had the benefit of, uh, of getting an understanding of what the US and, and, and the uh, uh, Western Europe are willing to do and capable of doing. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's a little bit of a zero sum game in terms of investments, uh, especially uh, on the uh, uh, continent of Africa. So what Russia isn't doing or can't any longer do uh, at the scale at which it was attempting, China can now do. So China benefited. Very few other uh, countries though, uh, other than in what part of Western Europe are beneficiaries. <coughs> Turkey is a beneficiary. Turkey made a choice and every country in the world had to make a choice and to, not to choose is making a choice. So you don't get away with trying to play both sides against the middle with many, too many countries did and I think to their disadvantage, uh, but Turkey sided with the West. Uh, Turkey is supplying drones. Turkey is working with the United States. Uh, Turkey is strengthened by this conflict. Uh, and uh, I won't go in, I don't have the time to go into much depth on these countries unless people want to ask about it uh, further. Um, uh, Qatar is a winner on this. Uh, not only did they uh, help the US immeasurably in terms of transporting uh, Afghan refugees, uh, through uh, Qatar Air's capacity, but um, they came to the United States and are doing everything they can to provide LNG uh, to Europe. Now it's limited because they have long-term contracts, but the fact that they want to help uh, is, uh, is noted. Uh, and so uh, I consider uh, uh, Qatar uh, certainly a, a uh, a beneficiary of this, although they're very much opposed to it. Uh, some of these United Nations votes have been instructed. Saudi Arabia, MBS doesn't seem to miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Uh, you don't chop up a Washington Post columnist and think that uh, 
uh, the Post or the United States Congress or administration is going to shrug its shoulders. That doesn't happen in the West. It should not. Uh, but this was an opportunity for Saudi Arabia to step up and say, uh, yeah, we're going to stop restricting the supply of oil and gas. We can, uh, we have the ability to substantially increase the supply of energy. And we know that that's going to help uh, with the inflationary situation in the US and Europe. And so we want to help. And they would have gained immeasurably in terms of uh, uh, appreciation uh, from the, the US administration, which they needed, uh, but they didn't. They clearly chosen to side with Russia, as has the United uh, have the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the UAE has a lot at stake, but uh, I think many people know the the Wagner Group is uh, is embedded uh, in the uh, UAE's uh, armed forces. Um, the um, they want the F 35s I don't think they're going to get the F thirty five. Anymore. I, I think there's going to be consequences for them siding with Saudi Arabia. Of course, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a rational thing to do from a, a purely, uh, I guess, pragmatic standpoint, uh, because they are authoritarian governments. And so they're siding with another authoritarian country. And they, they did plan to uh, overrun uh, Qatar. And, and uh, uh, those plans were uh, nixed largely by uh, 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 people like, uh, uh, like uh, Rex Tillerson and uh, others, uh, especially in the military, who understood the, the adverse consequence to the U.S. But and and Turkey played a role in that. But um, they uh, they're cooperating uh, in a major way with Russia in Syria, in Libya, to some extent in Egypt. And so I have to say that uh, that Gulf state also is a loser. Uh, in, in, uh, from this conflict. Uh, I won't get into Bahrain and so on. Uh, it, Egypt is, uh, uh, from an economic standpoint, is clearly a loser. Egypt uh, did want to, uh, 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 to work with Russia in terms of uh, investment, but it, uh, Egypt should not lose sight of the fact that of the billions of dollars that the US pours into Egypt uh, I don't think it will be compromised because it's dependent upon aid to Israel. Uh, but um, I don't think Russia, uh, Egypt did itself any favors in terms of the positions that it's taken. Uh, it's, it's Sudan, uh, the, 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 they made a terrible mistake, but they've, uh, uh, I think, in, in, uh, in siding uh, with Russia on some of these uh, votes. Um, uh, but of course, also they have close ties to uh, uh, the Wagner Group. Unfortunately, as was shown on this chart, and uh, uh, and the UAE, particularly in, in Yemen. So uh, then you get to Syria. Uh, I mean, Syria is a basket case, anyways. Uh, Syria uh, was the beneficiary of uh, Russia's uh, uh, scorched earth strategy, which was just horrible. They haven't paid a price. Uh, Israel. Uh, is trying to play both sides. They refuse to name Putin as the perpetrator. Uh, they uh, have largely refused to uh, condemn uh, uh, Russia. And, and uh, I, I think uh, some people will remember that. I don't think it's gonna particularly affect US-Israel relations because that's more a matter of domestic politics than Israel's foreign policy. Uh, I want to, so I, I just did kind of an overview, but I want to mention something else that will not be lost. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been mentioned. And, and uh, uh, I suspect uh, uh, Richard and Bassam are, are getting a little anxious here. What's, what's Moran going to talk about now? But <clears throat> there was a massive uh, outpouring of refugees. Uh, especially from Syria, uh, but also from other Middle Eastern countries. Just recently, in the last few years, they came into Europe. With some exceptions, they were not integrated. They were not readily accepted. Um, uh, it, Europe wasn't comfortable with that. And it caused a great deal of political instability, which is still being felt. Look at the French election. Ukrainian refugees, on the other hand, and I'm so glad it's happening, but they can go to Europe, they can go to Poland, 
and they're readily accepted and they're finding jobs for them. They're integrating them. There is no question that there's an element of racism, of tribalism and of uh, colonialism working its way here. The, uh, the North versus the South of uh, uh, the people in the, uh, in the West and the North feeling that people to the South are somewhat, uh, um, you know, almost inferior to their uh, culture. That's not true, it's wrong, but it's a reality. And I think that's something that we need to assess uh, because there's been a very different um, uh, uh, dynamic that has played, be uh, played out between Ukrainian refugees' acceptance as they come into other countries uh, with no money and, de and desperate conditions versus the refugees from the conflicts uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, that have come to come into countries that many of which were actually their colonial oppressors. Uh, I think that's a very interesting aspect that this conflict has exposed. Um, I'm conscious of the fact I'm not supposed to speak for more than 10 minutes or so, and I know I've done that more than that. Uh, but um, I don't think that this Ukrainian conflict uh, is in, first of all, it's in no way is it limited to the geographical area in which it's occurring. Its implications are worldwide, but its implications also are a turning point in terms of world history. Uh, this is not just one more occurrence in a sequence of unfortunate occurrences. Uh, this, this was a test. It's a test of the West versus the East. It's a test of one leader versus another. Uh, it's a test of what we believe in, stand for, and, um, and must embrace if we're ever going to have uh, a, uh, a, a peaceful world and, and a productive economy uh, throughout the planet. So um, uh, it has yet to be played out, uh, but um, I don't think you can possibly overstate the implications of uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Thank you for including me on the panel. Thank you, Congressman Moran. That was excellent. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so I just want to remind our audience members, if you have a question for uh, the panelists, you can send it to me in a direct message um, and I will moderate the discussion. Um, but I do have some pre-prepared questions to start. And actually, um, building off of Congressman Moran's last point, um, this question I would like um, for Minister Amin to, or Salam to speak to it. Um, so as Congressman Moran pointed out, there has been a very striking difference in the global response to Ukrainian refugee crisis than there has been to other ongoing Middle Eastern refugee crises, i.e. Palestine, Syria, which Lebanon you know, has overwhelmingly absorbed. And I'm wondering, um, has this difference in treatment, the global response to Ukrainian refugees, impacted popular support for Ukraine on the ground in MENA? And if so, um, how? Uh, is this question to me, uh, Basimo? Yes. Okay. So uh, first, I would like to start by, uh, you know, addressing the, the refugee issue because I was, three weeks ago, I was on a panel in a diplomacy forum in Turkey, Antalya. And uh, the discussion uh, was uh, very much focused on the refugee crisis within all the other pieces that are really impacting Lebanon because uh, all the statistics showed that globally, Per GDP, Lebanon is the largest host country of refugees in the world per GDP. So uh, the numbers came up that about 27% of the population in Lebanon is refugees, almost 30%, which is a very, very, very high percentage on a population basis. The reason I mentioned that is because the impact of what's happening now in Russia and Ukraine has really weighed very heavily on Lebanon because the refugees in Lebanon, including both 
uh, uh, Syrians and Palestinians uh, have been uh, really using the infrastructure in Lebanon. When I say infrastructure or weighing heavy on the infrastructure, that is already in very bad shape. Uh, and when I say infrastructure, I mean energy, I mean water, I mean uh, uh, everything that relates as well to food security, uh, telecommunications, educational system. All the schools in Lebanon have uh, evening sessions only for the refugees that start every day uh, at 5 p.m. all the way until 10 p.m. at night, particularly for Syrian uh, uh, young refugees. And the educational system as well in Lebanon, given the, the economic challenges, is facing tremendous difficulties. Teachers are asking for uh, uh, raises and they're asking for extra compensation and they're asking for so many different things. However, the international community, despite the fact that they do acknowledge the problem in Lebanon of how refugees are impacting the situation in Lebanon, same applies for Jordan, because we are talking more about the Middle East region and uh, Turkey. But the difference between Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and other host nations is that they are in way better shape than Lebanon, and they don't have the challenges that Lebanon have today. So as we have been asking for aid from so many different countries, they have been acknowledging the problem, and they have been acknowledging the fact that Lebanon Per GDP is the largest uh, country in the world hosting refugees. However, the response to that has not been uh, uh, fair for Lebanon. So everything that the international community is giving for Lebanon is the bare, bare, bare minimum of what Lebanon needs to be able to continue hosting in a proper manner the refugees, providing aid, food, shelter, uh, water, education, uh, uh, and everything else. So it is kind of, a, it is kind of a, a, a piece of what's happening in the region, except that because Lebanon now is going through all the other challenges, it is a major, major, major uh, uh, impact on Lebanon, uh, the situation of the refugees, particularly that in our discussions with the European Union most recently, we have emphasized the fact that a lot of the aid that's coming through the United Nations and other organizations to the refugees are not being measured very uh, uh, appropriately because a lot of the refugees now are getting aid from the international community and as well are working. They are having actual jobs in Lebanon and getting paid extra income in Lebanon, taking job opportunities from Lebanese uh, uh, citizens. So it's like you're paying aid and then there's another job and then in many other cases their circumstances really changed from a definition of the refugee. They are now residents. Many of them are not now really within the category of refugees and the social impact in Lebanon, my biggest fear as Minister of Economy because I feel it daily, is that the Lebanese citizens now and I, I hate to say that, are having a little bit of aggression towards that situation because they lost three quarters of their incomes. Okay, so... Um... Unfortunately, Minister Salam froze. So the next question I'm going to- um... One refugee. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's really creating a big dilemma within the country that I feel it's like a ticking bomb that will socially explode at some point when uh, uh, we have to tell a Lebanese citizen that's a bank manager with uh, a master's degree that your salary is uh, equivalent to what a refugee, uh, a Syrian refugee is getting monthly. Uh, and uh, because they have access to dollars in Lebanon, they are being able to get priority 
in, in hospitals because they can pay cash. They are being able to get priority on many different uh, services in Lebanon because they have hard currency and cash. So it's turning now into a very uh, concerning place uh, that might not be exactly answering. I, I, I might have answered your question, Basima, in a much broader approach, but I think it's important because this same problem, I can see it being replicated in other countries, including Jordan and other places in the Middle East. Maybe other places will be able to absorb it because they have plan B and plan C. Unfortunately, in Lebanon, we are working on plan B and plan C now mm -hmm. uh, to avoid a social explosion. Well, thank but, you. Uh, and sure. I think I think that that really kind of highlights or underscores one of maybe the unintended consequences of the European countries not being as welcoming to um, Middle Eastern refugees and then already weak countries in the Middle East having to absorb that. And then of course, leading to the tensions that you're describing, which will most likely become exacerbated. So my next question is for both you and Yasmin, you both spoke to, um, you know, of course, the, the stress on the agricultural sector uh, regarding inputs. And yesterday, the White House announced a historic release of oil from the United States Petroleum Reserve. The release will put 1 million additional barrels on the market per day on average every day for the next six months. And then after that, U.S. domestic production is expected to increase by 1 million a day, 1 million barrels per day. How do you think that this will affect some of the economic challenges that you both spoke to. Yes, me, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that President Joe Biden's approval ratings have been very low, historically low as of late. Uh, they fell further after his sort of plea to the Saudi Arabians and the rest of OPEC to raise global oil production. Um, but I, I would say that this was motivated by local domestic politics, where fo he's focused on inflation, the cost of gas, his popularity here locally in America. Um, in terms of how it impacts his relations with the Middle East, with the oil producing countries in the Middle East and the non-oil producing country, countries in the Middle East, I suspect that this is part of an ongoing um, sort of U.S. foreign policy of detaching and, and sort of re removing ourselves from the Middle East. I don't think it necessarily matters. I think the point here is that we're not as oil dependent on the region. And as a result, we're leaving the region, um, maybe not maybe not 100%, but we're definitely not as involved in the region and we're leaving the regions to, to their own devices to figure out their issues, which is, you know, we saw that under the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, which is why the UAE, you know, um, is sort of making these historic deals with Israel in an alignment against Iran. It's all sort of under the same umbrella of US sort of, uh, um, lessening its, its involvement in the region. Okay. Um, Dr. McFate, um, in your, in your um, presentation, you made it clear that mer the mercenary industry is expanding. And it was recently reported that Russia's offensive strategy focused on the Donbass, um, approximately 20 mercenaries were recruited from Syria and Libya um, to help Russia. Uh, how do you think the potential supply from MENA of fighters uh, will impact U.S. MENA relations and what should U.S. policymakers do in response to this shift? Um, sure, Basim. First, I want to just quickly address what Congressman Moran was talking about, about the refugees. Um, I'm an old Africa hand, and we've seen this before, this sort of the racial component of this. Um, you know, if you remember the Rwanda genocide, the Darfur genocide, all, you know, the wars in West Africa, Congo, and, uh, and the, the sort of lack of disinterest by the international community. But when the Balkans went on fire in the 90s, everybody was interested. So this is not new. And in fact, it's been weaponized. So Putin and Belarus, as you recall, weaponized sort of like Middle Eastern African refugees into Poland to sort of for political and insidious gain. 
in some ways, Libya, that's partly what the war in Libya is about, uh, is that whoever, you know, Russia is in Libya, not because it needs more oil. It's in Libya because whoever controls parts of Libya controls a spigot of refugees, small arms, narcotics into the European Union. And that can make Putin very political in the blackmail sense. So I think this question of refugees, it's certainly first and foremost, a humanitarian interest, but we're seeing actors like Russia use it in the most invidious manner possible as well. They're weaponizing it. Um, regarding your question, Basima, is that, you know, there are reports recently that you know, Russia is recruiting 20,000 mercenaries from around MENA. I, I've been following mercenaries for 20 years. I don't think that's accurate. I think that's Russian disinformation. Um, I don't think, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to use, um, you know, when Wagner Group was working in MENA and in Africa, like the Central African Republic, they were doing sort of training and equipping of, of sort of the elite of, of some units there. And they're trying to get those units to come to Russia, sorry, to come to Ukraine to fight under the Wagner Group. But I don't think that's anywhere near 20,000. Um, and I think that the whole question of the influx of foreign fighters, of course, is not new in the Middle East. But what's new is the commodification of it. And we see Turkey do some of this as well with Libya and Azerbaijan and stuff. So I think what we're seeing is, again, the growth of the privatization of warfare that we don't in the U.S. don't we don't think we don't take it seriously enough. Because if, if that's occurring, then you can use market mechanisms to curb it. Um, you know, you can use, you know, you can buy them out or buy them to stay home, um, which is probably cheaper than your average Javelin missile. So I, I think there is a lot of imagination space to think creatively about how we retard that market. But we don't really think that way. We just think in terms of conventional war, state on state war, and we don't think about the marketization of warfare. And it's not that difficult. We just need to be more cognizant of it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Katz and also um, Dr. McFate, feel free to jump in because there's some relevance to your presentation as well. So as we know, the MENA region has long been a target of the Kremlin's information operations and is actively being flooded with disinformation from Moscow amid the invasion of Ukraine. What role are Russian-based media organizations like Russia Today, Sputnik Arabic, IRA, as Dr. McFake um, referenced, having um, in shifting public opinion on the invasion for their Arabic audiences? Thank you. A very good question. Certainly, uh, as you mentioned, you know, RT Arabic in particular is especially active. Uh, you know, Sputnik, other Russian uh, media sources and uh, you know, they, they provide their content for free. In other words, it doesn't have to be purchased uh, like Western media content. So, um, and, it, and it does appear to have an, an impact uh, that, you know, what we are, in other words, they are, they are pretty assiduous in terms of flooding the space. Um, on the other hand, you know, we know from other sources like the Arab uh, Barometer uh, and other Arab public opinion sources is that, you know, Russia isn't real popular in the Middle East, uh, that uh, China is more popular and that uh, Turkey is more popular still. I mean, they all may be more popular than the U.S., but uh, you know, Russia, it, it's not necessarily, um, I think that, you know, Middle Eastern audiences, they see China bringing money and bringing benefits, whereas Russia basically brings problems or exacerbates problems. Um, you know, I think that there's, um, you know, th there is, I think, in, in the region, a, a degree of distrust for Russia that is, uh, you know, long standing. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of distrust for the U.S. as well. So I'm not quite sure, you know, how much Russia is actually benefiting from all this effort. I'm not saying that it's that it's not, but um, I think that uh, um, you know, Middle Eastern audiences, I think are pretty discriminating 
um, that it, it's not all, Russia simply isn't having it all its way in the information space um, by any means. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. McFate, could you please give a brief summary of your book, The New Rules of War, and explain how these rules are being applied by the Russians in the invasion of Ukraine? Sure. So um, thank you, Basima. So I wrote this book two years ago about how modern warfare is won, fought and won in the 21st century. And it lists like 10 new principles or ideas of modern warfare. And the first rule is that conventional war no longer works. And we've seen that with Russia launched a conventional war. We Everybody thought it'd be over in days. It hasn't worked because conventional warfare, which think of World War II, is very difficult to achieve and it no longer delivers victory. Uh, and we've, we can, you know, last 70 years, conventional wars have pretty much gone to zero. Um, other things include that we're seeing that some of the best weapons, one of the rules is the best weapons don't fire bullets. And this of course is disinformation and Ukrainians and Zelensky have been genius. They've, Russia is a disinformation superpower and they've completely outflanked Russia on the information domain and the sort of the cognitive battlefield. Um, we've seen one of the rules is that mercenaries will return. Well, this is a, a major component of this war and they're doing it to, to do it, you know, to commit human rights crimes, to intimidate the Ukrainians and to get the Eastern, you know, Russia imagines their empire to get it sort of looking towards Russia and less towards NATO. That's not winning. I would agree with, with Congressman Moran, although we have a comment uh, from one of our uh, audience on this question. Um, but looking also about how, you know, wars are won beneath the threshold of media and knowledge. So, you know, shadow wars are what's winning. And this is exactly what Russia is pivoting to. Some sort of shadow war where they're going to do some horrible things beneath the, uh, the sort of the, beneath CNN and Fox and BBC um, so that it all becomes questionable in the end. And lastly, how do you win wars? You know, it's not one, you know, in the conventional war rules, you, you won by killing more enemies, taking more territory and flying your flag over the capital. That's no longer how you win. Ukrainians can win by simply not dying. You know, they, they can win by denying Russia its victory condition. As long as there's an insurgency in Ukraine, Russia and Putin can never declare victory over Ukraine. And so these are ways that the West and that the US can, you know, basically turn Ukraine into, you know, their, the Soviets' Afghanistan until they finally leave of their own accord as they did in Afghanistan. And I think this is important for MENA because, and for the US because we need as a, as a global community to put Putin in a box and to also warn China that if you do this, you too will be in a strategic box. So I think it's important that we not underestimate the situation in Ukraine, it's in some ways, it's a very modern case study for the book, The New Rules of War. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Katz, in what ways do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine will shape the future of Mideast relations with China? Well, I think that um, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is not going as well as Putin appears to have initially thought. Uh, I think up until this, this war, Putin had the reputation for being invincible militarily. You know, he did pretty well in the second Chechen war, unlike Yeltsin in the first one. He uh, was victorious very quickly in Georgia in 2008. He seized Crimea in 2014 and he moved into Eastern Ukraine still still there and of course the war in Syria he's done pretty well you know and Libya more of a mixed bag but of course that's a more of a mercenary operation um, and now I think what we've seen is that uh, what everyone is seeing is that the Russians are not necessarily all that successful militarily 
Uh, and I think this is going to have a real impact. Uh, I think that if, if, if Middle Eastern governments were to be appalled by Russia's intervention in Syria, but thought that you know, the Russians were, had a, a better record at uh, protecting their allies than say the Americans did, or so they'd like to think, uh, I think that that you know relying on Russia doesn't necessarily look so great um, anymore. Now, of course, you know, China obviously its economic strength is tremendous. It doesn't seem to want to become militarily involved in the Middle East at this point. But I what I do think is that the the war in Ukraine is going to um, instead of being the rise or the return of Russia as a great power, I think we're going to see it sink even further uh, than it has, uh, and that uh, it'll, it's going to be more a, a US-China um, a game in international relations, uh, and that uh, you know, Russia will, um, you know, certainly at, at, at various uh, Zoom conferences I've been the Russians have proposed that yes, if US China is the main contradiction in international relations, Russia can lead a, you know, a third you know, poll or whatever. I, I think that the choice for Russia is that either at, at some point in a post Putin government, it restores its ties with the West and sort of sees China as a problem for it, or uh, it, it slowly but surely under Putin becomes. You know, truly the junior partner, uh, and that we what what we might see. I had an article on the Hill just a couple of days ago talking about that. If you know what China may find it, it in its interest to do is to restrain Russian behavior. They don't need the problems that Russia is causing. Uh, so I think that that China's influence probably will grow overall. Uh, in other words, that China can win if Russia wins, but China can win if, if Russia loses uh, in Ukraine. And I, I just think that that that, that this is, Putin's action is enhancing the moment when you know, we see sort of the U.S.-China competition as the main competition in the world. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Congressman Moran. The next question is for you. Ukrainian officials say that they have identified mass graves outside of Mariupol. New satellite images appear to show more than two hundred new graves to the west of the city. Um, and this comes as an estimated 100,000 people remain trapped in the city. Do you think, um, or is there ever a point where the U.S. may have a moral obligation to intervene? Uh, I think there is, but I become something of a hawk uh, on this issue, frankly, because uh, I don't think that uh, this conflict should be a matter of whether you're in NATO or out of NATO. Uh, you may recall that uh, President Clinton uh, finally decided that the only way to end the Balkan conflict was to bomb Serbia. I supported that uh, very strongly and it worked. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a classic contest uh, conflict uh, between the West and the East, in this case, between good and evil. Um, you mentioned the mass graves uh, uh, in, uh, in Mariupol and Bucha, and, and we will find them throughout the country, wherever the Russian uh, uh, infantry has, uh, has prevailed. Uh, it, it, they carry out not so much a military strategy, but an absolute determination uh, to kill, to maim, to plunder. I mean, they're, uh, it's almost childish the way that they go into these houses and buildings and they steal things because uh, these are conscripts, of course, uh, that are taken from, generally speaking, from uh, the uh, underprivileged, uh, economically underprivileged parts of Russia. Uh, they're easily influenced. Uh, the Russian generals are sycophants. Um, uh, there is no contest between the U.S. military and the Russian military in terms of training, in terms of uh, technology, uh, discipline, uh, and, um, and I don't think that uh, as crazy as Putin is, as amoral as he is, that he would venture to use nuclear weaponry. I think we frankly should have been 
more aggressive. We should have been more aggressive in 2014 when he took over Crimea because it was clear this is part of a longer term strategy to land block Ukraine, uh, starve them out uh, by taking the east and then taking the port cities of Mariupol and, and particularly Odessa. Uh, so, uh, you know, here I, for 35 years, I was a liberal democratic politician. People assumed I was a dub, but the more I look back on history, the more I experience and, and uh, uh, you, you know, the more familiar we get with people like uh, Putin uh, I don't think you can help but be hawkish in defense of our values of Western values. Um, and um, uh, we're going to find a lot more mass graves. Maria Pohl is going, anybody that uh, sees what is about to happen in Maria Pohl and then possibly Odessa, if you're human, you're going to be sick to your stomach. Your whole soul is gonna feel revulsion over what will be witnessed. This is evil and you have to address evil uh, in a steadfast way. And you've got to work with your partners and, uh, and you've got to stand up for, uh, for what you care about. And I, I think this is a turning point in history, frankly. Thank you, Congressman Moran. My next question is for Minister Amin Salam before he has to go to his next engagement. On April 19th, the Washington reported that Lebanon is close to reaching a, an agreement with the World Bank to obtain a $150 million loan for food security over the next six months. What additional steps need to be taken to continue to support the Lebanese economy to get right, to get back on the right track? How can the U.S. support Lebanon in this mission? Uh, thank you, Bessimo, for raising up this, this issue. Uh, and again, thanks for including me in this very, very, very meaningful and insightful and important uh, uh, event. However, I would like to conclude at least my participation uh, in this event with a big request really to the US government and to the, to the American people. I am a Lebanese American and I know the American morals and I rely a lot on them to stand by Lebanon. I know that the U.S. has been doing uh, tremendous work to sustain peace and stability in Lebanon, to back up the Lebanese people to the furthest extent. I have been working with USAID on multiple projects supporting uh, families and uh, small businesses. But today, uh, as most of the guests shared, we are really at a very historical time. Countries like Lebanon that are most vulnerable particularly when the world is witnessing a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties, a lot of evil. Uh, the vulnerable countries really get hit most. They get hit hard, and sometimes they don't survive. Lebanon is an outstanding model in the Middle East. Lebanon has a lot of very, very, very important, significant resemblances of what the U.S. really looks for in a country in such a region I think it's very important to stand by Lebanon to do more. Uh, particularly recently, we have seen that the U.S. has been engaged on multiple fronts, including uh, getting energy from Egypt uh, through the support of the World Bank and other international organizations where the U.S. has tremendous influence. However, things have been uh, stalling. Uh, we have been in discussions for over uh, eight months, almost a year now, even before I became a minister, to find those solutions for energy. Uh, because without the U.S. support, we will never be able to increase our energy uh, uh, production in Lebanon. Uh, there are a few other matters that the U.S. as well is significantly working on. But I think uh, you know, uh, engagement, they need a faster pace because every day that passes in Lebanon where we are missing energy, when we are having food security issues, uh, the social impact is growing negatively every day. And my fear is that we might get to a point that uh, we will have a social unrest, which will have uh, very negative circumstances on the country and might make things really uh, not possible to fix. Uh, I feel it as a minister. I feel it as a citizen. 
I feel it as an expert that has worked on the Middle East uh, from the US for over 20 years. And I can see on the street, uh, uh, hands on, what is happening in Lebanon. So we are very thankful to all the efforts put by uh, uh, both the US government and the US organizations. However, we need a more firm, clear commitment and to move fast on Lebanon as a, as a, as a country, as a model that should succeed and should uh, uh, prevail its message in the region, having over 18 different uh, religions and sects living in such a small geography. Uh, I think the U.S. would want to sustain this model in the region, would want to support it. And I am all uh, hope and, and, and uh, praying that we will be able as well on our behalf as a government now to work with the U.S. and all the international community to, re to really get Lebanon out of this difficult place. And I thank you for giving me the chance to be on, that pla on this platform today with all the distinguished guests to share this message and to keep working with all of you uh, for a better Lebanon and a better Middle East. Thank you, Minister. Good luck on your next call. We're rooting for you. Thank you. Thank um, you Okay, so I'm gonna have one more final question from the audience um, and I'm just going to direct it to the panel as a whole. Um, Amin has to hop off now. Um, and then I'd also like to give this, all of the speakers on the panel the chance to just say any final thoughts um, before we say goodbye for the rest of the afternoon. So um, the two questions from the audience members are somewhat related. One is, isn't Putin the winner in this case? As a spoiler, he has continued down this road since 2008. With this global crisis repercussions, he has sent, to, he has sent the message that a protracted prolonged conflict will have enormous chaotic effects globally. It appears that NATO, um, will probably try to shore up the risks of a disunited alliance by edging to find over ramps in the short term to avoid the long-term effects of the conflict. And then another question, which is related, is, is Ukrainian neutrality a likely outcome of the conflict? If so, is Russia and China a winner over the medium to long run? I'd love to join in. I don't want, but uh, I'm happy to defer to my colleagues who know much more than I, but uh, I tend to be more opinion and less informed, but not, nevertheless, that doesn't deter me, uh, Basima. So uh, I just happen to be joined by a gentleman who owns a company in Ukraine. Uh, he just uh, handed uh, a text to me on his cell phone that he has watched uh, the children watch their parents be run over by tanks he has seen the mass graves. He just got to the United States. Um, it just has happenstance that he just came into the office. Uh, it's real. Uh, and I mention it because uh, anyone who conjectures that Ukraine will be neutral uh, or that Putin is the winner in this, is just absolutely wrong. First of all, Ukraine isn't neutral. Ukraine is less neutral today than any country on the planet because it knows exactly what it's fighting for, why it's fighting. It's willing to give up its life individually and collectively for what it believes in, for what we call Western values, human rights, the rule of law, free enterprise, if you will, the freedom of speech, et cetera. Uh, you know those better than I, Basima. That's what Ukraine is fighting for. There is no neutrality in Ukraine today. Now, they may not be a member of NATO. They will become a member of the, United, the European Union. I think NATO needs to join Ukraine, if you will, uh, because they learn a lot from Ukraine and understand why NATO must exist, why we have to have strong leadership, why people like Marine Le Pen uh, should be rejected at the polls as aggressively as possible. Now, uh, so they're not neutral. In terms of Putin, you wait and see what happens when the mothers of those dead Russian soldiers realize why their children died. They're not going to stand back and shrug their shoulders and not speak up when they lost their loved ones for lies. 
They have no idea what's happening in Ukraine because they're being told just the opposite. This idea of uh, uh, Putin have, having 81% approval rating. What do you think happens when they say, no, I, uh, Putin's lousy, I don't support him? They get hauled off. Obviously, they're going to, uh, to, to tell the pollsters what they want to hear because it's what Putin wants to hear. Uh, now, um, uh, Putin is going to be able to stand up to those mothers. He's not going to be able to stand up to a military which is disheartened, which is demoralized, and which is losing in terms of its strategic mission. Uh, and I got to tell you, Basima, I think these sanctions are going to last for a long time. We're going to isolate Ukraine. We're going to isolate its economy. Uh, these oligarchs are already feeling it. Uh, you know, people think, oh, it's not a big deal if somebody uses their, loses their yacht or loses, uh, uh, you know, some of their girlfriend's palaces uh, in Monaco or whatever. Uh, the oligarchs are the first ones that are going to spread the word. Uh, that they're no longer welcome because they're Russian. Uh, and um, when these sanctions take effect and they're exhaustingly slow to take effect, but when they take effect, that economy is going to plummet. It's going to implode. Uh, and the ruble will, uh, when we talk about the ruble losing value now, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, so wait and see. Uh, and then, of course, it's compounded by the fact that this, is, uh, this has accelerated uh, uh, Europe's transition uh, to a less fossil fuel uh, dependent economy. So, uh, yeah, Putin's a big loser on this. And there's no neutrality in Ukraine. And those are both good things. I've got to leave now to talk with my Ukrainian friend. Uh, thank you for including me on this distinguished panel, Basima. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Moran. So um, that was an excellent answer to our last question. And I just want to um, invite the panelists, if there's any last minute closing remarks you want to share, please do so now. Okay. <laughs> Dr. McFaith, do you have anything? Um, sure. I think that, um, look, the, the sanction, I, to the neutrality question, I think it, it may be raised in a, some sort of ceasefire, but will it be kept by the Ukrainians that, you know, the Georgians hate the Russians. Russia is, really has no friends around them. And if we are clever, we would, the U.S. would do two things. One is that we prop up all of his, you know, all the adversaries to, a, to the Russian empire. And the Russian empire has had lots of that, you know, neighboring countries who have a deep disdain for Russia. Let's prop them up as we did in, in the Cold War to be a thorn in the side of Putin. And, and the second is that I think that we have to be clever about thinking of ways where we engineer it that Putin perhaps, you know, autocracies are very brittle. They, they have all of their power concentrated at the top with a, with a lieutenant and a very nervous autocrat. You know, if, if Russia, if, if Putin thought that he was, you know, some of his lieutenants were gonna have a palace coup, perhaps he would take them out for, the, for us all. So I think there's many ways to proceed um, that will eventually make Russia into a North Korea if that's what the world desires. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. I would just add that to what Congressman um, Moran and, and Dr. Katz said, I would say that the Russian military has massively underperformed while the Ukrainians have massively overperformed. And, you know, that's before the West, all of their, their transfers and weapons, weapons transfers to the front lines. Um, this will cut, you know, Russia is going to bleed in the Ukraine for quite some time, which is going to insulate them and keep them from spreading throughout the other parts of Europe. So they're going to use a lot of their toys in the Ukraine and it will put a dent on them. And then there are also now more sanctions on Russia than all other countries combined. So energy imports, SWIFT, like the central bank, like this is a historic, this is a historically like a hefty sanctions regime on Russia. And so, you know, maybe an oligarch whose yacht has been, you know, seized in Monte Carlo won't rise up, but food insecurity over time, which we just discussed, will cause political unrest and, and Russia's no exception. 
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Well, thank you. I uh, basically agree with what everyone has said, and certainly, uh, you know, with uh, Congressman Moran. You know, obviously, you know, even if, if somehow it's formally neutral, and President Zelensky raises possibility that the public is is not going to be neutral. They're going to be neutral the way that Finland has been neutral. And I spent some time in Finland. They may not be formally part of NATO in the past, but the Finns, they know who their enemy is uh, and they fought these people and they did pretty well against them. And I think that Ukraine is basically in the same position. But I also think that we have to uh, be, be mindful of what both the minister and uh, Yasmin have talked about is that, you know, Putin may be the ultimate loser, uh, you know, in, in the long run, but in the meantime, uh, what's happening can affect the Middle East, leading to problems that might not be fixable. In other words, it's that we can all be happy that, uh, uh, you know, at, at the prospect of, of Putin not prevailing, but a tremendous amount of damage is being undertaken. Certainly Russia will be neither willing nor able to fix that, that damage. It's going to have to be the West, the wealthier uh, Arab countries. Hopefully, China will see it. Also, it's in its interest. So, so that's the thing. In other words, it's um, uh, there's there's this conflict has much greater ramifications, and it's those ramifications that people I think are not focusing on as much as they should be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to everybody. Before you get off. I just want to do one last big promotional shout out and invitation for our big party on May 5th at the Mayflower, 5.30 to 10.30 p.m. It's a reception slash dance party, and we're going to have lots of great food, lots of great drinks, and I hope to see you all there, and please invite all of your friends, okay? It's an open house. <laughs> all right. Thanks to everyone. Have a great day. This was